Hello everybody, welcome to the Ozone and welcome to the Cliffs. Oh my god, this came out today. <laughs> I am recording an audiobook on the day it came out and I am so excited to read this. This is this actually, I think this is the first book I have actually um, gotten on the day it came out. So this is exciting for me because nobody else really knows anything about this book. I'm going in kind of blind with you, with all of you. So this is going to be exciting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. This is going to be my reaction, as I as I basically just implied. This is my reaction to the Cliff story, as well as just an audiobook. Um, and I'm so excited for this. You, I cannot tell you how excited I am for this book. So it, this one, this story seems a little bit shorter. Um, so th I think it'll be, uh, well, it's, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It, it'll be short. It will be short. Um, so, yeah, let's get straight in. Tyler knocked his sippy cup off the kitchen table again. Careful, buddy, Robert said, picking it up and setting it in front of his son. Robert tried to feel relieved that his already well-worn copy of How to Handle the Toddler Years, which he jokingly called the owner's manual, assured him that it was perfectly normal for toddlers to knock over cups, throw food and demonstrate an often overwhelming amount of emotional instability. But just because it was normal didn't mean it was easy. Play phone, Tyler said, eyeing Robert's phone on the table. Robert set a bowl of cereal and bananas in front of Tyler. It's not time for you to play with Daddy's phone. It's time for you to eat your breakfast and get ready for daycare. Tyler, distracted by his bowl of Cheerios, sliced banana, and sippy cup of milk, began happily eating. That's another thing about two-year-olds, Robert thought. Their emotions can turn on a dime. When Robert had last taken Tyler to the pediatrician, he had unloaded on her about Tyler's wild mood swings. The pediatrician had just laughed and said, welcome to parenthood. She had then promised him, as she always did, that the task of parenting would get easier as Tyler got older. But when would it get easier? When Tyler was three? When he was old enough to start school? When he was in college? Robert knew that for him, the hardest thing about parenting was that it was something, it was something he had to do alone. He had never planned to be a single parent, but he had no choice now that Anna was gone. Robert had met Anna his junior year in college. He never ha had believed in the finding the one theory of romance. Surely there wasn't just one person in the whole world who was right for you. And yet his and Anna's connection was immediate. They loved the same books and movies. And when they started having more serious conversations, they discovered that they shared deeper values too. They dated through the rest of college and got engaged right after graduation, agreeing on a one-year engagement to give them some time to get used to being real grown-ups with real jobs before they got married. Robert settled into a steady but not terribly exciting job with a local lifestyle magazine and Anna got a position as a first grade teacher. They got married barefoot on the beach and both sets of their parents chipped in to help out with a down payment on the house. Their little bungalow had seen better days but it still had plenty of charm, especially for a young energetic first-time homeowners uh, sorry, ex especially for young, energetic, first-time ho homeowners who were willing to put some elbow grease into renovating it. The only downside, as far as Robert could, was concerned, was the house's location, right next to the town's most notorious geographical feature, the cliffs. Although these rocky uh, outcroppings possessed a rugged beauty, they also had a grisly history. The highest of them was nicknamed Jumper's Cliff by the locals because it was a common site for suicides over the generations. Oh my gosh. It seemed that everyone knew of someone who had chosen to end it all at the cliffs. The jilted high school homecoming queen from Robert's mother, mother's generation. The businessman who lost all his money due to his bad investments. The grandmother with a terminal cancer diagnosis. There were stories about the cliffs that were fact and stories that were fiction. But true or not, these tales made people look at the geological features with a mixture of fear and awe, especially Jumper's Cliff. Teenagers gathered there and creeped each other out with scary stories. Younger kids whispered that the ghosts of the departed still haunted the place where they had chosen to make that final leap. 
Robert had grown up hearing these stories, and the cliffs creeped him out. Anna insisted that, while the suicides themselves were sad, the cliffs were just rocks. They didn't mean they didn't really mean anything. Besides, the house's proximity to the cliffs was why it had been such a steal. Attributing any dark meaning to the cliffs was nothing short of superstition. Robert knew she was right, and once they moved into the house he was so happy with his new wife and his new life that he hardly thought about the cliffs at all. When he looked back on it, the first year of their marriage was a blissful blur of love and laughter. In his mind he could play out scenes from that first year like a montage in a romantic movie, the two of them riding bikes together, cooking dinner together, cuddling in front of the TV with a big bowl of popcorn between them. Sure, one of them would sometimes have a bad day at work or come down with a cold, but these problems were minuscule compared to the happiness they took in each other's company. Although the first year of their marriage had been great, the happiest time in Robert's life had been when had come when Anna was pregnant with Tyler. They had been married two years when they found out she was pregnant, and they were both over the moon with delight. There was something about the idea that they had created a new human being because of their love. It seemed almost magical. As happy as they'd been as a couple, they knew they would be an even happier family. Throughout Anna's pregnancy, she had glowed like some kind of ancient mother goddess from mythology. Robert had glowed too, so full of love he didn't know what to do with all of it. He massaged Anna's feet when they were sore after she came home from teaching all day. He went out to fetch her mint choc chip ice cream when she said it was the only thing in life that could possibly satisfy her cravings. They were perfect. They were in perfect harmony during her pregnancy, two dedicated gardeners growing their baby together. But then things went wrong. Oh no, did she commit suicide? Uh, probably not. I'm, I'm probably being very morbid. Uh, two months before the baby was due, Anna started complaining of swelling in her hands and feet. When she called the nurse at the obstetrician's office, she had said not to worry about it. That swelling was common among pregnant women, especially in the hottest months of the summer. Reassured, Anna had bought bigger shoes and soaked her feet in Epsom salts and otherwise ignored her symptoms. But when she went in for a regular checkup, her blood pressure was so alarmingly high that the doctor insisted that she be admitted to the ho hospital immediately. After that, things were a nightmarish blur in Robert's mind. All the IV drugs the doctors gave her in a failed attempt to bring her blood pressure down, the decision to deliver the baby early by caesarean section or a C-section uh, in hopes of saving her life, uh, and the massive stroke she, shuff she suffered on the operating table that left Robert a single father. For a long time, he was numb. None of it was even real. Since Tyler was born early, he was tiny and unable to breathe on his own without exhausting himself. He had to stay in the hospital for a few weeks until he gained weight and his lungs developed more. In a shock to days, uh, Robert would visit his new baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. He would scrub his hands and put on a face, a mask, before entering the brightly lit white room lined with plastic incubators which, in which impossibly tiny babies lay. Robert would stand by his own son's incubator and look at Tyler's small skinny body wearing a diaper the size of a fast food napkin. The parents of the other babies in the NICU always looked tired and worried like Robert did, but they arrived in couples, so at least they had each other. In horror, Robert would look at his son and think, kid, I'm all you have in this world. It was not a good way to start out in life, motherless and stuck with a father who can eat, sleep or go a full hour without crying. In his exhausted, grief-stricken state, there were only two facts Robert knew for sure. He was all that Tyler had, and he was not enough. Robert had muddled through the last two years managing to hold down his job somehow and provide Tyler with food, clothing and shelter. Robert had withdrawn from his friends because he didn't want their pity and because for a single father of a toddler grabbing a bite to eat after work with his buddies was not an option. At five o'clock sharp he had to leave the office to pick up Tyler from daycare. After that it was time to go home and fix his supper. Then came playtime and bath time and if Robert was lucky and Tyler would actually fall asleep, bedtime. The toddler owner's manual was clear. Without a regular schedule, life with the toddler descended into chaos. Robert had quite enough chaos in his life, so he tried not to, de to deviate 
from the daily schedule. Once Tyler was finally asleep, Robert mindlessly surfed through the channels on TV or played Warrior's Way on his laptop. Sometimes Bartholomew, the orange cat, <laughs> sat with him, but most often he did not. Bartholomew, Bartholom, okay, let me let me figure this out. Bartholomew, yeah, it's Bartholomew. <laughs> I'm just going to call him Bart. I, I've done this in other stories where there's long names that I just can't pronounce, so I'm just going to call him Bart. Bart had been Anna's pet before she and Robert had married, and Anna used to refer to him jokingly as my first husband because of the way he guarded her jealously and had never warned, warmed up to Robert. Now, with Anna gone, Bart would accept food or the occasional pat from Robert, but he never gave Robert the impression that he was doing anything more than tolerating him because he was the dispenser of cat food. Was Robert lonely? Yes, painfully so, but he was also too busy and exhausted to do anything about it. After Tyler's bedtime, he allowed himself two or three hours of mindless screen time of one kind or another until he fell into bed himself, knowing that he was going to wake up to a day that was nearly identical to the one before with the type of and with the type and duration of Tyler's mood swings being the only wild card. Right now though, as Tyler was contentedly picking up Cheerios and stuffing them in his mouth, he was adorable. His hazel eyes, the same shades as Anna's. Um were framed by long, sooty eyelashes. His curly black hair... Oh, curly black hair. <laughs> that should ring some bells. Um, his curly black hair surrounded his head like a halo. Where have I heard that? I swear I have heard that exact same phrasing in a previous book. I sw somebody needs to go back and research that. I swear I have heard his hair surrounded like his head like a halo before. I think it was in um, Hide and Seek. No, it can't have been. No, it, it wouldn't have been. I don't know. Sorry. Uh, his curly black hair surrounded his head like a halo and his mouth was a cherubic rosebud, also like his mum's. In fact, Tyler resembled his mother so much that it made Robert's head heart hurt. Looking at his son, Robert felt overwhelmed by love, but also by fear. What if he lost Tyler like he'd lost Anna? Over and over, the what-ifs played on the screen like his, of his mind like a trailer for a movie no one would ever want to see. Even though Robert couldn't look at Tyler without thinking of Anna, he never talked to Tyler about her. Tyler was too young to understand death, and Robert wasn't doing such a great job of understanding it himself. In his heart, he knew it would probably be a good idea to start showing Tyler pictures of his mom and telling him little stories about the kind of person she was, the things she used to say and do, how excited she had been about becoming his mummy. But he could never bring himself to take out any of the pictures of Anna hidden in the attic. If he tried to talk about her, the words stuck in his throat and he said nothing. Even saying her name hurt too much, especially because when he looked at Tyler, he was staring into Anna's eyes, like he did every weekday morning. Robert choked back his sadness along with some black coffee and drove Tyler to daycare, letting him play with his phone all the way. After he had dropped off Tyler, he went to work, only nodding at colleagues who greeted him with good morning. He didn't want to seem rude, but he didn't want to get into a conversation either. His own reactions were too unpredictable. Once he started talking, what would he say? Would he get all emotional in front of someone he didn't even know very well? Would he break down entirely? And if he did break down... What if he wasn't able to put the pieces back together? <laughs> nice one, Scott. <laughs> Robert knew that no matter how bad he felt, he had to hold on to his job. It was the only way he could make any kind of life for Tyler. And so today, like every other, jet, like every other day, he sat at his cubicle and worked without stopping, trying to empty his mind of everything but the task in front of him. He stopped at noon and took out a sandwich, eating it so mindlessly that once he finished it, he couldn't have even identified what kind of sandwich it had been. He walked to the bathroom, then to the water cooler. He was refilling his water bottle when, he, when a voice behind him said, Hey. He jumped as though startled that he wasn't the only person in the building. He turned around to see Jess, the nice bespect... Oh my gosh. The nice copy editor. 
<laughs> I can't read that word, sorry. The nice copy editor and self-confessed grammar nerd who had been hired at the same time he was. She and he used to chat a bit before Anna died, before he was broken. Hey Jess, he said, moving away to let her have a turn at the water cooler and he hoped to go back to his desk without being disturbed further. He turned to walk away. Hold up a sec, Jess said. Me? Robert said, even though it was clearly him she was talking to. Reluctantly, he turned around. I was noticing you eating your little sad sandwich at your desk. Jess filled up one of those weird paper cones with water from the cooler. Who had decided that those were adequate drinking vessels? She, dr she grinned at him. Well, maybe it was a delicious sandwich, but it looked sad to me. And I was thinking, I know you can't go out after work because you've got a kiddo to fetch, but a lot of us go for out for half price sushi on for... Eh, half price sushi on Wednesdays at lunch. Maybe you could go with us sometime. Sushi had been Robert and Anna's favourite food. They had learned to love it in college and had also learned to use chopsticks together, picking up sushi rolls, drinking them in soy so in soy short. Oh my gosh, why can't I say words? Soy sauce and popping them into each other's mouths. There we go. While a lot of couples went out for steaks or seafood or Italian for special occasions, for them it was always sushi. How could going out for half price sushi with a bunch of random people from work live up to all those romantic sushi dinners with Anna? The answer was simple, it couldn't. It would only bring back memories to make him sadder. Still, Jess was nice for asking him, for taking pity on him. Yeah, maybe I'll join you sometime, Robert said, not even trying to sound convincing. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, Jess said, so sounding surprisingly disappointed. Robert? Yeah? He didn't know where this was going, but already knew he didn't like it. Wasn't this a workplace? Shouldn't they be working? She looked down for a minute, like she was collecting her thoughts. You know, she began, before things changed so much for you, you and I used to be friends. We used to talk. If you ever want to talk again, I'm here. Robert knew he was in danger of his emotions bubbling up to the surface, which couldn't happen. He couldn't be a basket case at work. He had to get out of this conversation and get back to his desk. That's very kind. Jess rolled her eyes. I'm not being kind, you goof. I like you. I've always enjoyed your company, and I'm a single parent too. Not for the same reason you are, maybe, but I bet we still go through a lot of the same stuff. Talking about some of it might be good for our sanity. What's left of it? Robert felt himself smile a little. Against his will, he was remembering why he had liked Jess. I'm down to crumbs myself, he said. It was a joke, but like a lot of jokes, it contained the truth. I hear you, and who knows, maybe our kids could hang out. We could take turns watching each other's rugrats so we can maybe have an evening out every once in a while. Don't make promises. You haven't met my kid yet, Robert said. And he just made two jokes in a row? <laughs> He's two, right? Yes. Well, maybe I should give it a year or two before I offer my babysitting services. She smiled at him. A warm, gen genuine smile. Listen, I... I'm giving you a free pass this week, but next Wednesday you're going out for a half price sushi with us. No more sad little sandwiches for you. Robert gave her a little wave. I will consider your invitation. Thank you. He turned to go back to his cubicle. It's not an invitation, Jess called behind him. It's mandatory. Mandatory sushi. Which would be a great name for a band, by the way. <laughs> true. Very true. I love Jess. Jess is great already. <clears throat> Robert sat back down at his cubicle. He was pretty sure that his conversation with Jess was the longest conversation he had had with a non-family member in months. Like someone who hasn't exercised in years and suddenly finds himself back on the treadmill, he was exhausted. No more chit-chat today. He stayed at his desk, where he worked non-stop until five. When it was the time to leave, he felt no sense of relief. He was simply moving from one series of tasks in one location to another series of tasks in another. Off went the graphic designer hat, on went the dad hat. Robert pulled into the parking lot of Tiny Tot At Academy and went into the cheerful red-roofed building to fetch his son. He entered the room with, a, with the big red number two on the door. The walls were peppered with construction paper cutouts and unintentionally abstract crayon scribble drawings. Robert found Tyler's bubbly young teacher, Miss Lauren, surrounded by toddlers, playing with the brightly coloured toys that cluttered the floor, cluttered the floor, sorry, while being outnumbered by volatile little people seemed terrifying to Robert. Miss Lauren looked perfectly at home and greeted Robert with a smile. 
She stood up to get closer to Robert's eye level. He was a happy boy for most of today, she said, though there is one little thing I should tell you about. Robert braced himself for bad news. He hoped Tyler hadn't hit some other kid or bitten somebody. It seemed like every daycare had once had one kid who was the biter. Nobody wanted to be the biter's parent. Miss Lawrence smiled again. Don't worry, he didn't attack anybody or anything. Robert let himself breathe a little. Miss Lauren pushed back her curly brown hair behind her ears. Why is there so much curly hair? It was just that today I asked the kids to draw pictures of their families and talk about them. Being two, most of them just drew blobs or scribbles. But then we sat in a circle and everybody talked about their families and who was in their pictures. Tyler's friend Noah noticed Tyler didn't have a mum in his picture and asked him about it. Tyler got a little upset. I think mostly because someone pointed out his family was different. Robert hated to think of Tyler being singled out because of his loss. Did that kind of behaviour have, have to start so early? Aren't these kids a little too young to even notice that sort of thing? He asked. He looked different at the toddlers in the room. Uh, he looked around at the different toddlers in the room playing with blocks or trucks or dolls. They were babies, really. Miss Lawrence smiled again. Oh, you'd be surprised what they noticed. They don't miss much, believe me. I told Noah and the rest of the class that not all kids have a mummy and daddy, that there are all kinds of families. And I talked about what some of those families might look like. I said the only thing you need to have to make a family is people and love. So I guess you could say it turned into a teachable moment. Robert stiffened. He hated the thought of his and Tyler's broken little family being used as a teachable moment. And for what? so the other te kids could feel sorry for Tyler instead of just making fun of him. He didn't want his son to be the object of ridicule, but he didn't want him to be the an object of pity either. But there was no point in saying anything negative to Miss Lauren. She was so young and bright-eyed and idealistic that criticising her would be ki like kicking a friendly puppy. He finally heard himself say, Thank you for letting me know. It sounded stiffer and more formal than necessary, but at least it was polite. You're welcome, Miss Lawrence said. I just thought I should say something in case, you know, you wanted to talk about it with Tyler at home. Right, Robert said. He didn't want to talk about it, not at his home with his son and definitely not here with a near stranger. You ready to go, buddy? He called to Tyler from across the brightly decorated room. Tyler looked up from the plastic dump truck he was rolling back and forth and he said, Daddy! He grinned, jumped up and ran to Robert, his arms outstretched. See, Miss Lawrence said, a happy boy. Robert had a hard time taking comfort in this statement. If Tyler was a happy boy, it was only because he didn't yet understand what he was missing. Robert didn't really want to stop for groceries on the way home, but he didn't see any way around it. Robert didn't care much about eating, but he knew that if nothing else, he had to make sure his kid's basic needs were met. Once he got Tyler safely strapped into his car seat, he said, We need to stop at the store on the way home, buddy. We're out of milk and juice. Toddlers ran on milk and juice the way cars ran on gasoline. They had to have it, and they burned their way through it at an alarming and expensive rate. Milk. Do's, Tyler said. That's right. We'll buy you some at the store. You can pick, you can pick whatever kind of do's you want. <laughs> Babble, Tyler sang. For some reason, when he said the word apple, it came out with a B at the beginning. You want apple juice? Robert said. This was the way the toddler's, uh, the toddler owner's manual said to handle kids' mispronunciations, not to call attention to them, but to make sure you repeated the word correctly. Yeah, papal juice. Tyler cheered. <laughs> so cute. You got it, bub uh, buddy. Robert turned into the Walmart parking lot and prepared himself for the ordeal of shopping. Tyler owned one t-shirt with Freddie Fazbear on it. But Robert had never thought of his son as a Freddy fanatic. He was too little, for one thing. As he pushed Tyler in the shopping cart past the toy aisles, though, Tyler pointed his index finger and yelled, Freddy, at the top of his tiny young lungs. What was that, buddy? Robert asked, looking around to see what Tyler was seeing. For a second, he thought Freddy was a kid Tyler recognised from daycare. Freddy, Freddy, Tyler yelled, his eyes wide with excitement. Robert followed the line of his son's pointing finger to, display, uh, to a display of identical plush brown bears with wide smiles, thick black eyebrows, and black top hats. The packaging proclaimed 
that what Tyler was looking at was a toy called Tagalong Freddy. But how did Tyler know that? With a surge of guilt, Robert realised how Tyler most likely knew. When Robert was especially exhausted or too sad to cope, and this happened more often than he would like to admit, he would plop Tyler down in front of the TV. He only let him watch age-appropriate programming and the cartoons, while they were no doubt eye candy with, his, with bright colours and rapidly shifting images, did at least make a pretense of having some educational value. But then there were the commercials, the terrible, terrible commercials designed by boardrooms of cynical suits on Madison Avenue to make children desire Technicolor sugar blobs masquerading as cereal, high fructose corn syrup suspensions masquerading... Wait. Oh my gosh, I just... I, I kind of blanked out <laughs> and just kind of read the same line twice. Okay, so let's start. The terrible, terrible commercials... I'm sorry, by the way. Designed by boardrooms of cynical suits on Madison Avenue to make children desire technicolor sugar blobs masquerading as cereal. High fruit coast corn syrup suspensions masquerading as juice drinks. No, I, I didn't mess up. It just said masquerading twice in the same sentence. Oh, whatever. And the latest toys based on the most popular of pop culture trends. You want to look at one of the Freddies? Robert asked. Tyler nodded and held out his hands. Robert placed the toy in Tyler's hands and Tyler's mouth spread into a beautiful smile that conjured the ghost of his mother. Even though the bear was encased in cardboard packaging, he drew it to him in a hug. Wove, he said. Well, shoot, Robert thought. It was hard to argue with Wove. 